So that's me with the most expensive piece of equipment in the world. What you're seeing is an image of me and a group of other journalists who were invited to Intel's D1X Mod 3 Fab in Oregon. This is where Intel does all of its most uh, advanced R&D research into next generation uh, techniques to develop future generations of chips. Now, what you're seeing here is the first commercial installation of a high NA EUV machine. Intel made a big song and dance about it in 2023 as it was getting the first shipments in through from ASML in order to build this machine that's going to power the future of Intel's roadmap. The reason why we were invited is that the machine is almost complete in its installation. Normally these machines go through uh, a period of four to six months of installation, then a few months of optimization and dialing in the settings to make sure that they're exact. What Intel are here, they're up to that dialing in the settings stage. The hardware is in, it's now all about the fine tuning. Now, this is the world's first commercial high NA EUV tool. That's high NA, numerical aperture, EUV Extreme Ultraviolet. Now, EUV Extreme Ultraviolet is 13.5 nanometers wavelength of light, of EM radiation. And the high NA here refers to the numerical aperture of the optics inside the machine. Standard EUV, as used at TSMC 7 nanometer and from Intel 4 nanometer, is 0.35 NA. This new machine ups that to 0.55 NA. Why is that important? It means you can draw features on silicon with smaller and smaller line widths. That means the density can increase and the idea is you get a better product at the end. The result is more transistors, higher density, and if your architecture team is right, then the product that will come out will be higher performance or lower power um, and with better cost metrics than what's come previous. Now, the high NA tool here costs, we estimate, around $350 million. Uh, ASML has actually recently announced that they're starting to ship a second commercial grade tool out into the ecosystem. They won't say where. And last year they said they have orders for at least five on the books. If we go to the regular EUV machines, the ones that have been in production for quite a while, they've sold a good number. I think the latest is around 100 of those, and they're about 150 million each. This is a step above because the optics are ever more complex. The size of this machine is somewhat unfathomable. I mean, it's hard to see the perspectives here, but we've got B-roll of people walking around the structure. Standard normal size people, this thing is around two, two and a half, three stories high. So yeah, this thing is immense. It weighs 150 tons. What SML did here is they shipped all the equipment over to Seattle through air freight, and then use land freight to deliver over 20 truckloads worth of equipment, over 100,000 different individual parts, all coming from ASML and ASML suppliers. That's why it takes so long to do it. And, the, and as I said before, we're going from this, uh, going from construction into the calibration phase. I have some other statistics here. So underneath the high NA tool is the subfab. This is where, um, all the chemicals and power and stuff. This sort's where that all gets sorted. And the design of high NA is a lot different to how it was with regular NA EUV. With regular EUV, the amount of space in the subfab was up to six times the amount of the floor plan of one of these machines. Now, floor plan is all critical because they try and pack them in incredibly densely. In this case, they've managed to make the uh, high NA tool, the equivalent floor space in the subfab underneath. There they hold, hold uh, the lasers that power the optics. Now I'll show, a, I'll show uh, a picture of the tool and we can see the optics is going to be on the right hand side of this tool. In order to get what they need, they use six 30 kilowatt CO2 lasers. Um, so six of those was 180 kilowatts. Uh, these are ganged together and pulsed at 50,000 times a second. Now, CO2 lasers aren't extreme ultraviolet. What they have 
is a continuous feed tin droplet system. Now this is just gonna sound like crazy science fiction. In a vacuum, they atomize tin droplets and fire them into the machine. These CO2 lasers hit the tin droplet once to flatten it, and then again, with a particular angle of instance that fires X-rays, or in this case, high NA, uh, EUV, 13.5 nanometer, that then goes through all the optics, this 0.55 NA, and then that's what prints um, the pattern from the mask onto the wafer. Now, one of the potential benefits of high NA is that with the smaller line widths you can print, you only need to do one run through, you only need to print once per layer on the wafer. In order to do that with regular NA EUV, you might have to move on to double patterning, which means you have to go twice through, and double patterning is arguably less accurate than using finer optics in this regard. The rated uh, speed of this machine is 185 wafers per hour, but that's at 20 millijoules per square centimeter. Now, think about it. I've just said that the CO2 lasers in this thing equate up to 180 kilowatts, and as a result, you're firing 20 millijoules per square centimeter in order to get this uh, high NA EUV pattern onto the silicon. That is one of the worst conversion factors of energy you'll ever see. However, it's vital in order to get the exact detail onto the wafer. Now these machines are actually run at perhaps around 50, 60 millijoules per square centimeter and the output of the wafers per hour scales linearly. Um, neither Intel nor TSMC nor Samsung or anybody else with EUV machines will ever tell you what dose this millijoules per square centimeter that they're using um, because it's a fundamental part of the IP of wafers going through the, their fab. However, we do know that ASML and partners and the foundry providers are trying to minimize that dose so they can put as many wafers through the machine as possible. Now, what's unique about the high NA machine here? Normally with these machines, what would happen is ASML will build it until it works, make sure that it's got a right combination of parts that work together, then dismantle it, then ship it off to the customer. With this first tool, in order for Intel to get the jump on everybody else, they're doing something slightly different. Intel is, chronologically speaking, three to four weeks behind ASML in ASML's development of their own internal testing tool. Normally, this would be more like six months, but in this time, the, but now we're at three to four weeks. This means that ASML is only very slightly ahead, and any time ASML does a change or a tweak or an optimization, it feeds back through to Intel, and then Intel does the same thing to try and match what ASML is seeing internally, which means that ASML can show off a wafer like this. It doesn't look like much. However, what we're seeing is line widths of the order of 10 nanometers. With regular EUV, the limit we've got to today is 13 nanometers. That's so line, space, line, and the width of those lines and the width of those spaces were 13 nanometers. That's with regular EUV, this 0.33 NA. With the high NA, 0.55 NA, those line widths are expected to go to eight nanometers. What ASML is showing off in this wafer, and here's a picture of me trying to take a bite of this wafer, is that they've reached the milestone of 10 nanometers, the smallest lines printed in a mass production tool. They've managed to make 10 nanometers in, um, you know, in the lab using uh, you know, non-high volume manufacturing tools, but this is on a high volume manufacturing tool, they've managed to get 10 nanometer line width. So incredibly small and incredibly gonna be dense when, we, when the PDKs for these parts are gonna be developed. Now Intel has showcased that the high NA part of their roadmap is gonna occur after Intel 18A. So this is gonna be Intel 14A, which we expect is gonna be in the 2027, 2028 timeframe. So as a result, they've still got several years to get this together, to ramp up, to make sure that they can run all the test vehicles uh, on this machine, to make sure that they can go after any you know, potential defects that this machine uh, might accrue. Because it's so different to regular EUV in terms of how it's designed, while the physics is only slightly different, the manufacturing tool itself is vastly different. 
However, there is good news on the horizon for that because after high NA EUV is hyper NA EUV. This is a video I want to do separately, but hyper NA is 0 0.75. What the committee around ASML and its customers have done is said we want the 0 0.75 design to be essentially an easy install upgrade from 0 0.55. This means it's not going to take another $350 million machine. Instead, it might just take a $300 million you know, mirror and optics inside. But the idea is that they don't have to go through uh, the arduous task of uh, designating a bigger space inside the fab, uh, more infrastructure to be able to support it. It should just be an easier slot in. Now, to correct a few things out there, just because Intel is installing a high NA EUV tool, doesn't mean they're ripping out their regular EUV tools. What, based on some of the comments online uh, in recent months, it's important to note here that 90% of all the tools that ASML have ever shipped in the lifetime are still in operation today. As part of this tour, we had uh, CBS, Bloomberg, I was there, um, we had Mike Rugaway from The Oregonian, um, and a couple of other lo local uh, press and an ASML representative, and she was saying how, yeah, all this equipment, the lifetime of it is, is, is incredibly long, and it's built to last. With Intel's new IDM strategy, previously they used to ramp up a new volume node, and then as the new one came online, they'd rip out the old one, and then they would only ever keep really the latest generation up. With their new Foundry model, they're gonna keep um, they're going to keep high volume process nodes going to the point where they can offer them to customers in the ecosystem that need high volume silicon manufacturing and then you know packaging with the with the, the other side of their business that means that any euv or high NA euv tool that intel is installing it's going to stay there a long 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 time and uh ceo pat girl saying you know he's making sure that that is the foundation of the next generation of revenue for the company. Now, going on a fab tour is an incredibly marvelous thing. 99.99% um, of the time, no cameras allowed. All the pictures you're seeing today were either taken by Intel's official photographer on the day or from CBS. CBS got special dispensation to bring their cameras in. They all had to be vetted and cleaned for such a clean room. However, the only agreement is that any material that they take, they got to share with everybody else on the tour, including Intel. So that's why we're showing you some, some of this amazing footage that came out of there. I have been in a total of a fab seven times now, which is more than your average uh, person in this industry. I think I've been to that Oregon facility now three times. Uh, I'll link to some of the other videos that I've done previously, such as putting on a bunny suit to go in there. And that time I actually touched an EUV machine during the height of the silicon shortages a couple of years ago. I've also visited Intel in uh, Malaysia, in Israel. Uh, I've seen the IBM 2 nanometer facility up in upstate New York, um, and also uh, Global Foundry's Malta uh, fab when they had EUV machines. I've got an interview with the Global Foundry CEO about what they did with those EUV machines, which again, you'll find linked below or I'll put a card up uh, somewhere up, up there. Going into the fab at this point has become a, a, bit, of a, a, a bit of a ritual, a bit of a routine. You, it's you know you're given specialist paper and a pen i mean they, 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 this is a notebook i had to write on these notebooks are essentially almost plastic vinyl and using specialized pens such that you don't get any fibers into the air um, the clean rooms that the fabs work in are a thousand times cleaner as than an operating room um, but you go in you know take notes ask questions on this tour was dr mark phillips he's the head of lithography at Intel, so while he doesn't necessarily deal in product or even process node, head of lithography means make sure these machines work and these machines work in high volume. So he deals with a lot of those. I think we have gotta get him on the channel at some point for a proper, in proper interview to ask about how Intel uh, is enabling uh, EUV, uh, what the next process is, steps in lithography and some of the new techniques. Cause I know that there are some companies with some uh, new techniques in the process line that are gonna help with the throughput of some of these wafers to get to the more advanced process nodes. 
but he was there he was giving a wide explanation because most press there had never been in a fab before or he didn't even really know what a process node was um, so they got a crash course on the latest generation of hardware um, i always like the fact that these uh these machines are just massive in scale and so incredibly complex i've had the pleasure of seeing one essentially half built and you get to see all uh, the super accurate uh, molded aluminium inside and all the pipes where all the uh, gases and all the, all the stuff goes. I even managed to find one of the suppliers that uh, provides the tin for the tin droplet mechanism um, I was talking about because the first EV machines didn't have a continuous feed mechanism. You essentially had to put an ingot in and the machine would, you had to turn off the machine off, put the ingot in, turn the machine back on it would uh, put it under high pressure and vaporize it, and that's how you got your tin, but you had to shut the machine down. The later versions of EUV use continuous feed droplet technology, which is what we're using today. I actually found one of the suppliers for the tin ingots, um, and I said, hey, I've got a bunch of questions, just you know, out of my own personal curiosity. You know, what, what, what is the feed ray? Uh, how much does it cost? That sort of thing. They wouldn't answer any questions. Um, just goes to show you, you know, just how much of that, how much of this is kept under lock and key and kept secret. Um, there was a question on the tour about, well, hang on, isn't this you know national security type uh, protection because Intel's trying to bring manufacturing back into the US? Uh, and Intel said, yes. However, as you may notice from these shots, certain parts are blurred. And they designed this tour such that those that were filming could actually get you know maximum filling out of uh, what they were filming um, unlike last time when i visited uh, we had to go through with a very fine tooth tooth comb and uh, blur out everything that needs to be blurred out um, if anyone gets a chance to go on a fab tour i highly recommend it they're very rare few and far between the fact that i've been on seven is amazing uh, didn't expect to go that you know i think my first one was like in 2016 so to do all of those since then uh, I think is quite amazing. Uh, I've got open offers to go visit uh, more of Global Foundry's facilities, for example. I'm fingers crossed Samsung opens up uh, in due course. There, was, there were meant to be fab tours from Samsung in 2020. However, COVID happened. Uh, TSMC, there's the, the only tour in recent memory I can remember is BBC got to go in about four or five years ago, pre-pandemic, to do a four minute short video about the latest generation technology. And that's it. I've never heard of or seen of a press tour uh, since. However, with more facilities being built in the US and the competition uh, increasing for the leading edge technologies, especially packaging, I expect some of these fabs are gonna eventually open up as, as they get more competitive. And as we enable this next generation of uh, EUV, get all around transistor technology, we're going into fork sheets and then 2D materials uh, that stacked uh, transistors, CFETs, complementary FETs, they're also in the works. And upcoming up, 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 coming up is actually uh, the IMEC Futures or ITF World, as it's now known. That's going to be in a couple of weeks over in Belgium. That's going to be a fascinating look into the future of transistor technology and how we get there. Um, I would love to say that I'm going. Unfortunately, I have a clash. But if you're looking out for new ways into transistor technology, more information about what's coming up in the future, then uh, iMac Futures or ITF World is, is a good place to start. My main specification here is let me eat a goddamn wafer. Um, still in calibration phase, so uh, we're going to time it and, and make sure that Intel's ready. Come on, clock's ticking.